So my name is Klaus Birken from Itemis, um, and this is the longest title I ever had uh, for a presentation of mine, so three full lines. And uh, this is why I will start with unpacking this title, first of all. So um, what does it mean? So first part, adding complex cross-cutting functionality. So this could be any kind of framework which does something with your models. And in our case, it's a, it's a variant management framework we, we are developing since 2016. And a, a couple of colleagues who are also with me here are also developing this. And this is one example. And this is the one I will use today for, uh, for extract some useful patterns. And this is the, the basic requirement. So we have this complex cross-cutting functionality and we want to apply it to nearly any language. Yeah. And this could mean either languages from the past or from the future, which will be created um, later, or languages which we cannot access, where we only have the, the uh, possibility to use it, but not change it. So we cannot do things like adding some stuff to this language, but we have to add our complex cross-cutting functionality in other ways. Um, yeah, and, and the, the content of the talk is basically look at the mechanisms and challenges. So, so which mechanisms of MPS did we use to accomplish this? And where are the limits? So where cannot, can, can, can it, uh, can't it be done without changing the language? Yeah. Before I, I start with the actual talk, uh, here's a disclaimer. So, um, yeah, up to now we developed this, this variability framework with yeah, many people over many years. And so um, we, we, we did the usual refactoring, but we didn't step back at one point in time and look at it and uh, yeah, try to understand what we have done. Yeah. And so this, I thought this community event is a good uh, uh, moment to do this, to step back and look at the architecture or the mechanisms we have, all, we have used during the past years um, yeah, and this is what I will do now. So most of the, the slides um, I created for this presentation, so I didn't use them before. So maybe it's a, also in, in this sense, it's an experiment. Um, what I'm trying to do is to abstract the mechanisms we were using and abstraction always involves simplification. And this might end up in something which looks quite trivial or philosophical. So this is a risk here. I don't know if, if um, yeah, you can tell me afterwards if, <laughs> if I managed to do it right. Um, yeah, we try it because, uh, yeah, I, when, when preparing the presentation, I already had some insights and it also was fun and I hope it's the same for you. Um, so this talk will have three and a half um, sections. First of all, I will go through a couple of patterns and mechanisms for extending languages, language concepts. Um, and second, I will give you a brief explanation what the variant management stuff actually is we were building. Um, and then I will put those two together and look at how the patterns apply to this uh, variant management framework. So let's start with the first part. Um, so this is a very simple mechanism. You all know it. You have one language with some concepts and you extend this language by another language, L2, um, where you extend some of the concepts from, from the first language. Yeah. This is yeah, very basic, which allows to mix nodes in the same AST, in the same abstract syntax tree from the two languages. Um, and you uh, need no right access to the L1 language. Yeah, so there's a causality here. You need the L1 language to extend it, but you don't have to change it. You just write your L2 language and add these expressions. Um, one additional thing, if you have models built for this uh, construct, then you usually cannot just remove all the L2 concepts or L2 nodes from the model, then it's, um, yeah, it's out of order usually. Because those L2 things mean something, like in this example, you have an expression and you have an uh, extended expression. Um, if you remove it, then your model is, uh, cannot be used anymore. Um, this is a very strong coupling 
let's look at some more uh, lightweight coupling, which is this one. So here we have a, a language L1 again with some element. And um, we want to add stuff to those nodes, but not via extending it. Maybe documentation is a good example. Yeah. And there is a nice way of doing this in, in MPS. This is attributes, or in my case, node attributes, which you can attach to other concepts which have existed before. And you just yeah, add those documentation node attribute to existing nodes. And the nice thing is you, you can do this after the fact. Yeah? The, the element doesn't have to know some, something about this documentation node. And depending on the semantics, now you could strip all the L2 nodes because if it's only documentation or something else, some annotation-like things, then you can just remove it and the L1 model still makes sense. Um, now I have a short intermezzo looking at those node attributes. So most of you will already know what node attributes are, but still I want to um, give a, a basic explanation. So a node attribute is some element of an AST, but with one special um, property, and this is it's stored below its owning node, which is the, the thing on the left, on the right here. Yeah, so it's this node has two ch children, but it can also have one or many attributes, and they are stored yeah, very similar to the children in the containment hierarchy. Yeah. But in the editor, it's vice versa. Uh, and this is a part of the power of this construct. So here you can you can build editors which contain the node with with its children, and the attribute is enclosing it. Right, and you, you can show something um, to the top or to the bottom, to the left, to the right, or at all four sides. So you can embed the editor self of the node into the editor cell of the attribute. Um, let's look at at an example. So this is a, an implementation uh, of the equals operator from Brace language. And as you can see in the, in the MPS generator, these node attributes are used heavily. For example, these this macros are um, uh, node attributes and also this, this template fragment element is a node attribute. And now let's look at how this template fragment is implemented. So how do you do it? First of all, you create the concept, um, and this doesn't extend base concept, but it uh, extends node attribute. And then a checking rule will inform you that you have to add this attribute info element. And now you have to specify what's the role of this annotation yeah, in, the, in the owning concept, and also which concepts you can use to add your attribute to. Uh, and in this case, it's very generic. It's a base concept. Um, okay, and in the editor, you can do the thing with this blue and, and yellow boxes from the slide before. You can specify some editor projection and you can put somewhere in there the attributed node. Yeah, this is quite common. Most of you will already know it. Now, I couldn't resist and look into how the attribute info is implemented. And uh, actually, the attribute info is implemented using itself. Yeah, which is nice, I think. And um, yeah, if you think about it, also the concept declaration, so its attributed concept is implemented using itself. Uh, and uh, when I look at this, I'm thinking of this kind of uh, thing, which is a Möbius strip. Um, and the, the question is, so if you start thinking about this structure, then you probably, this is, an, um, analogous to thinking about this question, what happens when cutting the Möbius strip lengthwise? Yeah, I don't know if you tried it, but I will return to this later. So, but this was a little deviation. So now let's look at uh, this mechanism. This is how the, the template fragment was implemented. We looked at before. Um, so here we have a node attribute again, but we are... Uh, uh, attaching it to a base concept. And this means we can attach it anywhere uh, in, to every node in our model. Um, still, L1, so a specific L1, yeah, does not need to know when uh, 
nee, L1 has not be, to be known when you're building L2, so you can do this after the fact and then attach it to any element. This is really flexible and probably we need something like this for our cross-cutting framework, but maybe it's too generic because the user experience is usually not so nice when doing something like this. So you can attach something to anything. We have to restrict it somehow or do something to configure this. And uh, yeah, one nice example how to do this is this, um, this marker interface style. Yeah. Now we have three languages. It's getting a bit more complex. So we have uh, some concept and we want to be able to attach documentation to it. And this is a, this documentable, iDocumentable example is from Com Embedder Core Base. It's a quite old thing, probably 10 years old. And let's look at the, the causality. So the order of, of we can create the languages. So L1 must exist before L2, which is not always the case. Um, and L3 cannot be created before L1. But this is, this is not a big restriction because we can... Um, so in this example, um, this element documentation is actually uh, a part of L1. So L3, L1 can all be the same. Uh, but the, the important restriction is that when you build the something concept, the I documentable already has to be there. Uh, and I said at the beginning, what we want to achieve is for any language, even languages which ex already exist, but we, which we cannot change anymore. And so I try to come up with a pattern which resolves this, uh, this uh, close interaction. And this pattern looks like this. Um, so we still have the documentable and the element doc, but now we do not connect it to the something, but to some marker helper concept. And this is some kind of, of glue code between L1 and L2. Uh, we, use the framework i documentable via the marker and we are able to attach the marker as a node attribute to something and i actually tried this and this is the first demo so i made a little experiment let's see so okay this is a, a base language class and now what I, what I can do, so documentation is a, is a common concept. There are various ways of, of adding documentation. But I want to add this iDocumentable documentation. Um, and I actually can do this by adding the marker first as an annotation. And then I have the iDocumentable marker interface. And then to that, I can add the, uh, the actual documentation. So let's do this two-step thingy. So first I add the, the doc marker. Uh, this is not a nice user experience, right? And then I can add the documentation to DocMarker, and now it looks like this. And uh, this, is, this is not very convenient, but what I can do is just create an intention which does both in one step. And now suddenly I use the iDocumentable functionality for a language which was much older than the iDocumentable language. Um, okay, I can add the, the documentation here. It turns out that what I'm actually doing here is nesting two node attributes. So I have a node attribute in a node attribute and the editor will fail. Yeah? So the, this cannot be used with a nested node attribute, but it can be used for other applications. So let's go back to the, here. So this was what we were building and I already said this uh, additional node attribute is not necessary, but we can derive a pattern from this. Uh, so what's actually helpful is this one. So we have some interface or some abstract base class from a framework. We derive the glue code as a node attribute, which we can attach to any language, which is L2. Uh, and because it needs a name, I called it dynamic marker. And now we can uh, yeah, extend the L2 language, can attach stuff to it, and bring in functionality from L1. And this is what we were actually doing a lot. 
And this, this helps in, in various ways because you can add the, the very L2 specific user interface stuff to this L3 glue things. And the framework will contain the, the majority of the code. So in our case, it's typically 95% come with L1 and 5% are in this L3 part. Okay, this is the end of the first part. Now let's uh, look at our application, which is a variant management or variability management framework. Um, yeah, this is not so important. You have to understand it to a certain degree, so I explain it a little bit. Um, I should probably go to full screen. So this is a conceptual overview of what, what, how, how variability management usually is solved. So you're defining some product space. You can think of this as a, just a set of, of feature switches. And after you define this, you can create configurations just by choosing from this set and saying feature one is true, feature two is false, and so on. Then you come, uh, yeah, you, you have your artifacts, which are the, the models of my any language. And now you're able to add some conditions to those artifact models in order to switch off parts of these artifact models. This can be done by these filters. So if you have a certain configuration or variant, you can put it together with these development artifacts and you get concrete artifacts. I will show you an example soon. First of all, let's look in this blue yellow uh, layer again. So this is how, uh, how our framework does this it's a dsl for for uh, creating such feature diagrams and also another dsl for building these configurations um yeah this is only the input yeah for now for the, for the scope of this talk it's just a collection of boolean switches this is all what we need and now what we want to do is so on the right hand side you can see there is a, a base language class and we want to apply our framework to base language, for example. So what we can do here is attach some things to this model. For example, we connect it with this feature model. And after having done this, we can add these conditions yeah, to, to various points in our model and uh, refer to those features over there. Yeah. We can do the same thing for other languages. For example, Embedder Doc, which is a documentation language from, from the Embedder platform. Uh, it looks very similar, but actually it's a different language. Um, we talk about chapters and sections and, and text strings here. And this could be, for example, um, used for, for creating one documentation for each variant by doing this filtering, yeah. removing <laughs> notes from here, and then translating it to HTML, and then you have uh, various documents for each variant. Uh, you can also apply it to more complex structures like this one. This is some hierarchical component model, an architecture definition language, where, where you can add these, these uh, presence conditions. Um, yeah, This can be done because the underlying model is still an abstract syntax tree, so the, all the concepts work. Um, now we have three different use cases. Um, these are the most common ones. They are also some others. So the first use case is if I have a configuration, I want to look at the resulting model after filtering it according to this configuration. So in, for example, here, um, the, the cable feature has been switched off and therefore this condition evaluates to false and this section should be removed. Or the, what else do we have? In, in this configuration, cable has been selected, and so the cable section is still here, but the DSL section has been removed. So depending on the settings of these features here, we can filter down the documents. First use case. This is the second one. So usually you want to do something with your models, like generating code or generating documentation or we are providing some XMLs for the for subsequent steps. And this is also something we want to be able to do. So we have the, our 150% model, which contains all the, the, the superset of all possibilities, 
we have the configuration and then we do the filtering and we get HTML different documentation for the different variants. And the third use case is automatic consistency checking. So we want to be able to find inconsistent variants. So in this example, um, this is again base language code. Uh, this upper method calls the status rate 5 me method, which is below here. Both have a presence condition. And now it could happen that this presence condition is false. And this is true. So this uh, status rate 5 would be removed by our framework. And this is still there. So then we have a dangling reference. And what we want to find is all possibilities which or all inconsistencies which may happen like this. So show me a configuration which breaks this reference. So these are the three use cases. And now this was the, the very brief presentation of what we are doing there. Um, now let's put those two things together. So first of all, this is the, the dynamic marker pattern again. And now uh, specialized for our case. So what we were doing here is we have some target language, for example, base language, where we have a statement. Now we want to be able to attach these conditions to the statement, these presence conditions. The framework comes with a variation point interface, and we extend this variation point interface by a concept, which is at the same time a node attribute which can be put, uh, which can be attached to statements. So this is the glue element connecting the framework functionality to the actual target language functionality. Um, okay. And we up to now have yeah, two kinds of these markers. One is what I called anchor marker, which is the one on the top, which um, provides the entry point for all other features. So you can edit and connect your model with a variability model and afterwards um, the editor provides all the intentions you need to add these these presence conditions and then we have the detail markers which represent the these presence conditions and a lot of unmarked nodes yeah, because uh, you might can see there's the return statement is marked with a detail marker but all the stuff in 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 its uh, expression here is not marked it's just below this return statement. Okay, and my, my model my, of, of thinking is like motion capture for models. So what we are attaching via these node attributes is like probes, uh, configurable probes, which are attached to various points in the AST. And we don't change the target model. We just add the markers and it's uh, minimally invasive, uh, like with motion capture, you don't want to, to hurt somebody. And then we can use this structure to analyze the data, to produce results, to do the filtering and so on. Um, we are using an auxiliary data structure, which is called internally skeleton tree. And this is called like that because of this maybe motion capture analogon, but uh, rather it's an, um, yeah, we just pick the nodes from the AST, which have conditions and the root node. So this uh, get status state NAS node will show up here. The return node will show up here. And because they are nested, those, uh, those uh, nodes are nested too. So what we do is create an auxiliary tree which represents exactly this variability aspect of our models. Um, and now we can use this tree to implement all the use cases. Uh, this is a more real uh, skeleton tree from some customer example. It's still small. Yeah. This one spans 10 root nodes and combines several ASTs. Um, and this is the input for our subsequent steps. So what we can do now is to do this analysis based on these dynamic markers and then create, for example, the preview, the filtering, the model checks. I can show you two of them, maybe in another demo. Um, so this is the, the base language class again. 
the one from the slides. And what I can do now is to select some configuration and everything marked in gray will be filtered for this configuration. And I can actually do the filtering and remove it and then hand it over to the code generator, for example. The, the green conditions show that they evaluate true in this configuration, so this will be part of my variant. Um, this is one thing, but what I also, yeah, I, I can, for example, now, now switch to, a, to another configuration and compare them uh, and check out what will be removed there and what will be part of, of the variant there. But what I also can do is, is run this check which will show, okay, this could be a dangling reference if I created a configuration with these values shown in the pop-up here. Yeah, and this is a check running against all possible configurations. So we do not check only the list of existing ones, but everything. And for this, we, we use an SMT solver. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. Um, I think what's what's also worth mentioning is that yeah, what properties of ASTs are we using? We cannot rely on specific things from a given language because we want to apply this to any language. And so we have to use generic um, properties of this S model AST. And I tried to collect all these properties we are using. Maybe it's not complete yet, but one thing yeah, for sure is the tree structure because yeah, if we, in our world, filter something, so remove something from the model in one given variant, then all the, the complete subtree can be removed. Because if you uh, re remove a, a base language method, then all the code inside the body can also be removed. Um, this is one use case where we uh, yeah, exploit this tree structure. There are others. Uh, quite interesting is what we can do with the references. So in a generic way, a re reference points from one source node to a target node. And this could be either a reference which breaks if the target node is filtered um, and the source node is still here. So this is something we want to check, the first use case. And the, the second use case is we can implement a logic which automatically filters the source node if the target node's not there. Uh, you can uh, think of this, this example. So if one of those components is filtered, then we also do not need the, the nodes for these connections. Yeah. So what we can do automatically is, if this is removed, then please remove also the, the uh, connections. And the connection actually is an element which has a reference to the component, and so we can do this very generically. Um, and what uh, some uh, some more property of of some references is that there is a a concept of instantiation in many DSLs. So in this component DSL, you can imagine we create some we define a component and then we instantiate it a couple of times. Yeah. And you you find in many DSLs this kind of instantiation semantics. And we introduced features in our variability framework which exactly use this instantiation semantics. Probably this could be extracted in some library or some, some uh, more generic framework. Because what we can do with here is if you instantiate something several times, then you might configure the various instances in a different way. Like a car with four wheels, you probably want to configure the front wheels differently from the from the back wheels, um, and there could be nesting on instances. So instances in any DSL have various properties which we also exploit here. Um, yeah, I will skip this for now. This is how to implement this logic, 
this automatic filtering logic. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are also limits uh, where we couldn't do things in this generic style I was showing before. Um, and whenever we encounter this, we try to identify it clearly and try to solve it as still as less invasive as possible. But sometimes it's, yeah, we, we didn't manage to. And I want to show two examples. Uh, currently we have three, but due to time issues, I only talk about two. Um, so, and it's still the goal to minimize the, the dependency from the target language to our framework. Because after all, we want to be able to take the, the framework away and the target language is still alive. So one, one of those limits is that there is only one way of generically marking editor cells in MPS. Maybe I, I know, don't know the other way, but uh, this is what we found so far. So what you can do generically is highlight the cells and you can select the color. And this is why we used in this preview this gray highlighting for representing the, the fact that this thing will be removed. But users told us, well, it's not clever to highlight it if it's being removed. You should rather hide it. Yeah. And so, um, so it, it should look like this. Yeah. But there is no generic way of hiding editor cells. What you can do is in the editor definition, add a show if with some condition, but we don't want to change the language. So we cannot do this. Um, so how we solved it? We, we added or we created an interface, I can hide, which is not in our framework, but in some common layer. So I should put it uh, on the very bottom in some common open source platform layer. I don't remember, I think MPS extensions. Yeah. And so this interface can be used to switch the visibility of something in your model. Yeah. This is more generic than talking about variability. So this was our trick kind of to solve this. And now with this interface, you can add uh, yeah, this two concepts in your target language and then hide stuff arbitrarily. And variability is then using it to hide stuff. This is not nice because we have to change the language, but after all, we can remove the variability framework and the language is still alive. Um, the second limit is uh, more profound. Um, so, we are adding semantics by adding this variability uh, functionality. And there is a point where the semantics we are adding clashes with the semantics of the target language. And this is very abstract and here's a concrete example. So imagine there is this DSL which, where you can specify folders with, which have a name and you write a checking rule which uh, shows an error if two folders have uh, the same name because it's a duplicate name problem and we don't want to have this. This is so in a in a concrete model this would be a problem which deserves an error but in a 150% model this is maybe not an error because as you can see here this first folder will only be there if feature A is selected and the second folder will only be there if feature A is not selected. So these are mutually exclusive, but it's only in our dynamic markers, in our node attributes. So the, the folder language doesn't know about this semantics. And this is how, where, where we should do something. Yeah? Because this name duplication is okay and we have a checking rule which will mark it anyway. So what we have to do is to do something with this checking rule. And one approach we... Uh, we used so far is to build a little language extensions which can be used in checking rules um, which is called for all variants and this will look for all configurations in your solution or in some scope and do the filtering and then run the code of the original checking rule against each of the variants. Um, this is seems to be easy because uh, yeah, the, the author of the checking rule only has to add this for all variants thing but we add a dependency here to, the, to our framework. And 
this is this doesn't scale because if there are hundreds of configurations this won't work yeah, we already added caching and things like that so this is not a proper solution when i was preparing the talk i came up maybe we could also add the dynamic marker pattern here so that we avoid the dependency we can just uh, um, attach this marker to the for each statement and say for all variants this would solve the dependency issue but it still doesn't solve the the performance issue and our way to solve this then is to to provide a framework where you can write code for the smt solver which then checks for all possible variants uh, this is hard to to express in in java code but if you have a solver then it's uh, feasible or quite easy depends on the logic of this checking rule but then you have to re-implement this checking rule um, and remove the the old one okay this was the just another limit yeah. okay so let's wrap it up so what i've shown is uh, this dynamic mar marker pattern which we were using or are using extensively um, based on this node attribute concept with the, uh, you have seen it and this helps when building such cross-cutting frameworks which can apply for any target language with minimal changes to the target language. Our goal is still no changes. Um, now, just by doing these annotations. Um, yeah, I also mentioned the limit. I, I won't repeat them now. Um, now, one question I took from the beginning was, uh, are there other applications of this uh, pattern, of this mechanism? Yeah, Cross-cutting framework uh, applied to any or uh, a, a set of languages and um, one application uh, i found was so also after the fact was this one where we added some safety specific uh, functional safety mechanisms to c code yeah. so this is c code and then you add these kind of dynamic markers where you say okay i want to apply some redundancy mechanism here and i have to say or mark some positions in the code and yeah this is a framework of applying safety uh, mechanisms to code but also to models like SysML models and others um, so this works in a quite generic way but uh, yeah obviously not for all kinds of languages and then i i yeah, we're thinking, okay, only two examples. Probably this is not the, the point where I aimed at from the beginning, so variability in this. Um, but after thinking hard, I came up. So now we're back to the beginning. So the MPS generator is actually another example because also here you want to use any language and then attach a lot of these markers like template fragments, macros, and then do something with it. Again, motion capture, get something out of it, do the filtering, do transformations, and then put it out. And this was quite surprising that I started to think uh, across this line, and then I came back to this, what's already existing since 10 years or longer. Um, so we are back to the Möbius strip. Yeah. And uh, you probably remember my question, what happens if you cut it lengthwise? And, and nowadays, no talk should be without ChatGPT reference. Yeah. So I asked ChatGPT to uh, give us the solution in, as a limerick. So I don't quite like it, but... Um, and you still don't know what happens if you cut it. So yeah, I encourage you to try it. Uh, just take a strip of paper, put it together, twist it once and then cut it lengthwise. Yeah, it's surprising. But there are also many videos, so you don't have to do it on your own. Um, so that's all. Thanks for your attention. Maybe for this uh, name, Semantic Clash, couldn't you put a property macro on the name, then make it um, unique, and later in the generator, you could use the original name? Original name. 
this would resolve the duplication if there is any, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we could do this, but on our level, we want to check it when we are still in the model. And I think then without changing the original language, it's hard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, during the last three, four months, I spent quite some time extending our existing languages with new languages that make, now that expand existing possibilities with expressions to make them time dependent, for example. And we wanted to do that as loosely as possible. And I, well, I think I got into similar problems as I saw that you were trying mm -hmm. to solve. And one of the things was in the model checking, so which you in the end didn't solve actually. Um, and I had a similar problem. So and, and one of my well the ideas I thought we might need is some way in MPS, some method to um, to specialize or to change the model checking to so to to mm -hmm. change the model checking mechanism and say, oh, I want to. There is a model checking in the existing language for a specific model checking problem. And I want to say, well, you still should do that, but only in a limited way, only in this occasion. And that would solve somehow the problem. Then you no need to change the existing language. Mm -hmm. um, so I got the idea that something is lacking in MPS to when you are extending languages, you need a more advanced um, manner to do that did did you explore ideas in that direction or uh, we very quickly come up with this for all variants thingy and yeah. uh, started solving it with this because extending a language is also mps like but it doesn't solve the actual problem yeah you're right yeah. Um, and now i uh, i had the idea that we could add some annotation there which removes the checking rule and then it could be maybe overridden, but yeah. I don't know if there's a, a, yeah. a mechanism in MPS built in which can do this. Yeah, I, I have been looking for that. I didn't find something that worked somehow, but in it, I was looking for some overridden mechanism in some mm -hmm. way or another and it didn't succeed. Halfway your presentation of thought, well, I should rethink how I extended the languages and yeah. maybe use your framework, but then in the end, I think, oh no, you, because mm -hmm. I, uh, my changes are also minimal, but some similar to yours. Um, okay. Yeah, I think so. Couldn't you override the generator for the checking language? Maybe, yeah. I didn't try it, so I I don't know. Could be, yeah, and trigger it with some of these dynamic markers. Yeah, so I, yeah. if you annotate the, the rule and then you make a higher priority generator for the checking language, which wraps yeah. the original check in some more of your code. Yeah, I will try this. So the problem that you mentioned about the model checking, it's actually quite f similar to an issue that we were discussing with JetBrains, how to override model checks without extending the language directly, so without, without extending the concept for which the check was written. So maybe in some way where this feature request is implemented, you could override the checks with a custom behavior and then get rid of certain problems you have. Mm -hmm. Because depending on the attached attribute, you can have custom implementation of the check without changing the original language again. Mm -hmm. But I think there is at the moment no limit, uh, no way to do this. Oh, it's not implemented yet. Yeah, the ticket is there and uh, we talk with JetFrames, but I think the feature request is still pending. Okay. So I'm quite optimistic now that we can solve this. Okay, no more questions? No? Okay.